Well, we pick it up in Acts chapter 2, verse 20. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, the Bible says, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Now, this is the day of Pentecost, and Peter's explaining what's going on. And part of which, uh, or I should say the, the things that the speaking in tongues, the prophesying, and the things that the people in Jerusalem are experiencing from the apostles are a partial fulfillment of, of, a, uh, of a prophecy in the Old Testament. And then we come to verse 20, and there's actually a space of at least 2,015 years between verses 19 and 20, because verse 20 isn't talking about the day of Pentecost. It refers to the time right before Jesus returns. And we know from the book of Revelation that the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood right before he returns. And then it says in verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And to call on the name of the Lord isn't just a one-time prayer to God. It's not, Lord, I'm calling on you. Do you hear me? Now I'm saved. No, to call on the name of the Lord means to have an ongoing relationship with Jesus. Those who call on the name of the Lord in the biblical sense have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So Jesus is important to them. Jesus is their best friend. Jesus is the one that they look to for salvation and leadership. And those are the people who are saved from hell. Verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. The Old Testament predicted that the Messiah would do miracles to show the Jews that he was the Christ. And Jesus did those miracles. And the apostle here is reminding the Jews listening that he did do those miracles and that it was a fulfillment of Scripture. 23, him being delivered up in accordance with the established plan and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. The crucifixion of Jesus was a part of God's plan. But at the same time, the men involved with that crucifixion, for that crucifixion, responsible for Jesus being betrayed and crucified, are accountable for their sin. Peter calls them wicked. And by the way, as I mentioned earlier, Peter certainly isn't lacking boldness since he has received the Holy Spirit, is he? He looks this mob straight in the eye and he says, You killed him. You killed the Son of God. You killed your Messiah. Peter didn't care what anyone thought of him. He was going to boldly proclaim the Word of God no matter what. 24. But God hath raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held. The Bible says the soul that sins will die. Jesus never sinned, and that's why it was impossible for him to remain dead. 25. For David speaketh concerning him, I beheld the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. David kept his eyes on the Lord. And in this verse, he says that Jesus did that as well when he was here on earth. And consequently, neither Jesus nor David were shaken during stressful times because they always had their eyes on the Father. You know, you focus on your problems and you're headed for discouragement. You focus on Jesus, and he'll get you through. Now, he may not take the storm away. He may not take the problem away. But you'll find out that he's a great shelter in the midst of a storm. 26, therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. 
Jesus knew that good times would follow his sufferings on the cross. And he made it through the bad in part by focusing on the good that would result from the bad, namely our salvations. Verse 27, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou permit thine Holy One to see corruption. The word hell in this verse doesn't mean the lake of fire. It actually means Hades, which is simply the realm of the dead. Before Jesus Christ died on the cross, there were two compartments to Hades. There was paradise and there was torment. After he died, Jesus went to the paradise section and took the souls of the righteous to heaven with him. And so that's what this is talking about, where he went. Thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades, neither wilt thou permit thine only one to see corruption. And then it says in verse 28, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And so the Father raised Jesus back to life and restored the joy that he experienced before the sufferings of the cross, and then some. 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. True. David died like the rest of us will, and he remains deaf just like the rest of us will until Jesus, is, Jesus raises him on the last day. Verse 30, Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him that from the fruit of his loins he would raise up Christ in the flesh to sit on his throne. And so David knew that the Messiah as regarding his human nature, would be one of his descendants. That's kind of a neat thing to know about, about one of your descendants somewhere down the line. Verse 31, David, foreseeing this, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh seek corruption. So Jesus didn't stay long in the paradise section of Hades, uh, just long enough to tell the wicked on the other side that their doom was sealed, and just long enough to tell the righteous to pack their bags because they were going to heaven. And so the soul of Christ didn't stay long in Hades, <clears throat> and the body of Christ didn't stay long in the grave either. 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Every single one of those 120 people who were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost had seen Jesus multiple times after he was raised from the dead. They were all eyewitnesses of his physical, bodily resurrection. 33. Therefore, being exalted by the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath poured forth this which ye now see and hear. And so the apostles knew that Jesus made it to heaven because he had told them that after he arrived in heaven, he would send them the Holy Spirit. And lo and behold, they have the Holy Spirit. So Jesus evidently, when he ascended, he made it. 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he himself saith, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. So after Jesus ascended to heaven, God the Father told him to sit down and wait for all of his enemies to be defeated. Once sin has run its course, Jesus will return to earth, and the devil and his demons and all who will reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will be thrown into the lake of fire. Our, our Lord's enemies will be defeated once and for all with no chance of a comeback. 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. In other words, Peter is saying, you guys killed him. 
You guys rejected him, but God has made him Lord in spite of you. Man's rejection of Jesus does not knock Christ off the throne. Impenitent sinners will answer to the one they reject. 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter preached the word of God, holding nothing back. And as a result, the Holy Spirit convicted these people of their sin. And they want to know what they have to do to be saved. They're under such great conviction. They're feeling such guilt. How can we get out of this mess that our sins have put us into? And we learn a valuable lesson here that should not be forgotten. If the word of God isn't preached clearly, as Peter did, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, as Peter was, then lost sinners will never understand that they need a Savior. Instead, they're going to be comfortable all the way to hell. And so they ask, what do we do? Here's his answer, 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you, re you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In other words, <coughs> excuse me, in other words, you want to be saved? Then repent. Receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and be baptized in his name. Pretty straightforward. Pretty right to the point. No need to add anything. No need to take anything away. 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. <clears throat> if you're saved, then you have the Holy Spirit. And you know that you have the Holy Spirit because you love Jesus. Even when you sin, you love Jesus even though you're not showing it at that point. But you know you have the Holy Spirit because you want to please Christ, and you feel bad when you don't, and conf you confess when you fail. The Spirit of God inside of a Christian compels them to feel that way and to do those things. Verse 40, And with many other words, <clears throat> excuse me, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Peter preached the word of God telling people to get saved from hell and in the process be delivered from the perverse lifestyle of this world. And by the way, if one is not delivered from a per perverse lifestyle, they're not saved either. 41. Then those who gladly received his words were baptized. And that same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Those who believed the word of God proved it by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and by being baptized. Those who rejected the word of God went on their unmerry way, which ended in the lake of fire if they did not change their mind before they died. Verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayer. So the saved started going to church, and church meant that they were taught the word of God, they received Holy Communion, and they had fellowship with other Christians. And so their main focus was Jesus, and the rest of their activities in life were like spokes protruding out of that spiritual hub. <clears throat> 